So parents, you're like a training wheel on a bike. Your job isn't to make the bike move. Your job is to keep the bike upright. Those of us who are the true educators, we really want to be given the opportunity to educate the whole child. We can get free college degrees based on all of the opportunities that are out here and available to our students. That's oftentimes, as parents, I think we want to protect our kids, but I think one of the greatest gifts we can give them is allowing them to experience adversity. Yeah. Here's your host, Danita Bailey. Well, welcome to School Days, Help for Moms and Dads of school Age Kids. I'm Danita Bailey. We began producing School Days because we really just wanted it to be a resource for parents regarding topics pertaining to school. We also aim to bring awareness to parents about topics that may not be on our radar. And for sure, the juvenile justice system was one of those that wasn't on my radar at all. And if your child hasn't had a brush with the law, you're probably like me. And as I dug into this topic, though, I discovered that school and the juvenile justice system have a really strong connection increase of certain types of disciplines, sometimes for minor offenses, and police presence in schools is being criticized for having a negative impact on our youth. So um, we are welcoming today um, Judge Alex Kim, and um, he is from um, District, which district? Well, it's the 323rd District, which is all of Tarrant County. 323rd District, right, um, from Tarrant County, and he is a juvenile um, district judge in Car Tarrant County. So we'd like to just know just a little bit about you. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, um, let's see, I grew up in, well, Army, U United States Army brat. Mm -hmm. uh, my family came here and emigrated from South Korea uh, back in 1956. And then, so I was born here on a U.S. Army base. My, my father got his draft number for Vietnam, and he was number three. And so he knew he was going. So he went ahead and enlisted and, and traveled around a little bit, grew up on a couple Army bases, and, and settled down in Houston. Uh, from there, went to high school, went to college, went to a small Bible college up in Illinois, uh, transferred to Baylor, did some uh, Ph.D. work, and then... Worked in the IT sector until I decided, hey, I want to go to law school. And kind of had a late start. I was 31 when I went to law school. Okay. And then um, came here to Fort Worth to go to law school, which is now A&M School of Law. And then just was a, a practicing criminal defense attorney. Um, handled several high-profile cases here in Tarrant County. Uh, I was kind of a legal analyst for our Fox and, and WFA, uh, ABC affiliates, uh, whenever uh, cases came up that drew a lot of public interest. And and got, kind of got involved in politics and decided to run for judge. And um, just in 2018, uh, won the Republican primary and then won the general election. And so I've been in office here in Tarrant County since January of this year. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Before we go any further, we do want to let you know that we would love for you guys to join the show. So if you have any questions, uh, we would love for you to give us a call and speak to us and tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, our phone number is 214-431-5062. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So you work a lot with, um, with kids in general. For your job, what do you do in your spare time that you have an opportunity to work with kids? Anything? You know, in my spare time, I coach every year. I coach uh, youth lacrosse. Yeah. And, you know, I played in high school and I played in college and I wanted to coach again. Um, you know, they've asked me to coach at the high school level. I've, I've always only wanted to coach junior high. There's something magical about that age when you catch kids at junior high where you can really shape them and mold them and, mm -hmm. and teach them about hard work and integrity and honesty, self-discipline. You know, once they're 15, 16 years old, there's not a whole lot you can teach them about that. I but know. when they're 12, 13, 14, uh, what you can do to really instill about good, good values on how to become a man, that just sticks with them. And I have kids that that are out of college now that come back and still talk about what a life-changing season that was uh, from what they learned about that. And I was, I was, I'm a tough coach. Yeah. You know, I, I don't take a lot of slack from these kids, but uh, I think that's important. Parents are willing to trust me to teach these values to their kids, and I need to take it really, really seriously. And so uh, that's kind of what I do in the community. Uh, avid hunter, fisher. Like I love, right now it's dove season, so it's great. <laughs> that means deer season is right around the corner. And so that's... That's kind of the compromise me and my wife make is during deer season, she's kind of a single mom, and the rest of the year I'm here to to do everything I can for her. Okay. Yeah, I like that age too, by the way, because um, they don't know everything yet. 
Yes. They're still wanting to... They don't feel like they know everything right. yet. Yeah. They, they're open to the idea they may be wrong. Uh-huh. You know, and they're still kind of... I'm not going to say they fear you, but they still respect the authority. Uh-huh. And once they get to 16 or so, they, you know, they feel like they've kind of they've developed into their own shell and there's not a whole lot. They're going to be right. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's, it's a magical age where you can really make a difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why did you decide you wanted to become a judge? I love the academic portion of this. So there's two reasons, really. One is this idea of just studying and reading and, and interpreting the law mm-hmm. and be able to use that. Uh, my experience, my knowledge, my work ethic to to help jurisprudence, help the law here in Tarrant County. Uh, the second side is is um, it's this idea of civil liberties are big, very big for me. And you know, when you're a lawyer, you're fighting for your clients. Whether you're a prosecutor or your defense attorney, um, you're just you're there to advocate. As the judge, it's kind of like a umpire in a baseball game. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a strike or a ball. I mean, that's it's a strike or a ball. You just call it. Because whether it's a strike or ball, it's just a pitcher strategy, hmm. right? Um, and I love this idea where the judge is the final gatekeeper on civil liberties, where you know, if our legislature is wrong and they write a, a bad law, well, the judge is there to make sure that people aren't punished for bad laws. Or if one attorney is overzealous in what they're doing, you need to make sure that the other side gets a fair trial. And that's all I'm there for. Uh, as a judge, you don't hear all the facts. You only hear what's presented during trial. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I'm kind of a neutral third party and, and whoever wins or loses doesn't matter to me. I don't have an agenda. Uh, the attorneys are there to present their cases, and I'm sure to, I'm there to make sure that every side gets what's called due process. They have a fair day in court. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I heard that the, or I read that the affluenza case was um, somewhat of a reason why you were more interested in becoming a judge. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, this, so the whole Ethan Couch affluenza case, and that's the one that won't go away. <laughs> I, I, th- I think the dad just got arrested again last week. Oh, no. my understanding. So, yeah, so that was, that's kind of a dark spot. And I want to kind of clarify. So, so the judge who handled the Ethan Couch case, she was the predecessor to the judge before me. Right. And she was a uh, groundbreaking and a pace setter in child welfare law here in the state of Texas. She would speak at conferences, wrote papers, wrote books. I mean, she was very highly respected in the CPS side of things that this court handles. Um, but she, you know, would make her own decisions on the juvenile justice side that, you know, I think, looking in hindsight, the public disagreed with, mm-hmm. uh, I think. And, you know, we have to kind of flesh this out, that the juvenile justice system is built on this idea that every child can be rehabilitated. Mm-hmm. Our focus on all the children that kind of run wayward is that we need to rehabilitate them, and we don't need to incarcerate unless we absolutely have to. Uh, we have to make this effort as a community to put these kids back on the right path. Um, and I think that was Judge Boyd's focus on this one, is that she felt like this kid could be rehabilitated. Um, and obviously the community felt different, and... Um, you know, different judges have different perspectives, but that's who the voters elected and put in there to make that decision. Um, we have to remember, any time a judge makes a decision, there is so much information that the public does not get. Right. And it only comes out during court. In juvenile settings, under Judge Boyd, all these court proceedings were also closed. So the public has no idea what was actually presented mm-hmm. evidence-wise. There could be additional stuff. We just know a little bit of uh, what the media has told us. And so... Uh, in that perspective, it, it seems like it was very, very inappropriate. I know at the time it, it didn't seem right to me, uh, but on the other hand, I, I'll be the first one to admit I didn't have all the information that that judge did at that time. Mm-hmm. You know, and, w- and when you talk about life, though, and this is kind of a segue outside of just juvenile justice, but you know, my perspective on life is all we can do is we can, anytime we make a decision, we make the best decision we can with the information that we had at right. that time. Mm-hmm. And it's unfair to look back in hindsight and say, well, I would have done this because if we're in hindsight, that means we have more information, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So, and you can't, as long as at the time you're making the decision, you make the best decision possible with the information that you have at the time, then you shouldn't look back and second guess yourself. And I think that's one of those maxims in life that we should all have carrying forward. We're all going to make mistakes, even even judges, right? Yeah, absolutely. But the idea is at the time is as long as we're confident in our heart that with information that we had, that was the best decision possible, then I think it's unfair to judge ourselves on a different standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit, though, about what, because most people are like, what is the affluenza case? Yeah, so affluenza was uh, this idea that you have a child that grew up in a very privileged environment. And because of the privileged environment, you don't have the exposure to elements of life that other people do. 
And so that would reduce your level of criminal culpability, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's the fact that you're, you're almost too well off that you don't appreciate the consequences of your actions. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was kind of something put on by the psychologist at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, Did he coin that term or was that? He had been using it for years. Okay. And it, this is just the first time it really came up. But, and, and the psychologist is actually a very respected psychologist, very well published. And this is just one of the things that he looked into. Uh, he's testified on the same thing uh, numerous times before the Ethan Couch trial. But Judge Boyd, for some reason, felt like this child deserved uh, to get probation, that he could be rehabilitated. So he was driving drunk, and he killed four people and injured two. Is that what happened? Right. I think there were two serious. I think there was, there was a numbers. But yeah, he was driving like 70 miles an hour down a neighborhood uh-huh. uh, while intoxicated and hit a car with people in it. And there were people in the back of the pickup. I think that was the, the fact pattern on that one. And he got probation, and the prosecutor wanted him to have 20 years? Yeah, the, the so. state, the district attorney's office wanted him to be committed uh, okay. to the Texas Juvenile Justice Department. Right. Um, and remember, commitment is, is the last resort. That's uh-huh. when you're saying a child cannot be rehabilitated. Yes. And judge at the time felt that this child could be rehabilitated. Uh, the chief expert witness was a psychologist that used the, that um, came up with ideas, affluenza. And I don't know what the judge was thinking. I mean, we can assume, I guess, that the judge thought, that was compelling. I, there could be other factors as well, though, that maybe affluence had nothing to do with it. Maybe the judge just saw something in this child that he could be rehabilitated. And that's why she gave him probation instead of committing him. So what happens as far as rehabilitation when they get probation? How, how right. do they help them turn things around? Well, so that really depends on what kind of case it is. Uh-huh. Right? So some of these cases, so we can go with the most minor cases. It may be uh, maybe a kid got caught with marijuana. Okay, at the mall or at school. All right, and the idea on those kind of cases is, you know, maybe a drug class, maybe understanding really the negative effects of marijuana. Mm-hmm. And without getting into a whole public argument whether marijuana is good for you or not, I think <laughs> everyone in the world can agree that marijuana is not good for kids, for the developing yeah. brain. I uh-huh. mean, that's there is no scientific article that will say that it is healthy for an eight year old to smoke marijuana or no. a 12 year old, or as long as the brain's developing. Right. And so it's this idea. And it's developing until they're 25. Well, it depends. So it's because that's a process called myelination. Uh-huh. Right? And so myelination actually completes. And for your listeners, if they're not familiar with myelination, it's there's a protein sheath around the neurons in the brain called myelin. And so it's from the, the input part of the brain to the decision making part of the brain. These neurons that carry this electrical signal, well, the protein sheath is an insulator. And so this electrical signal saying, hey, you know, that's a hot stove and I shouldn't touch it. And so you make that decision not to touch it. Well, that is based on this electrical signal. Well, what happens then is while you're born, you don't have myelin, right? It's That's something that develops over time. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have myelin, the electrical signal signal literally just dissipates. It never reaches the decision-making part of the brain. And so, and myelination, once it's complete, that allows us to input our, our senses and then make the decision and send the signal back saying, do this, don't do this. Now, something pain is a very strong signal. So that's why even children know not to touch hot stoves, while children may not know that, you know, if I, I don't, know, don't put the toilet seat up when I pee, then I might splash, right? They may not get that. Yet, right. Okay. Un, um, so until mom or dad punishes them and then it becomes a you know, a a negative experience. So what happens then is myelination does not complete uh, until for females, 24, 25, and Uh males as late as 28 is when when myelination completes. Uh And so when your kid says to you, or when you say to your kid, what were you thinking? And they say, I don't know. They literally did not know because physiologically their brain does not carry that electrical signal because that insulator of myelin was not there to to allow the signal to reach the decision-making part of the brain. Mm. So that's, (laughs) sorry about this. This is not No, that's great. we, we talk about that. We've talked about that in multiple shows. And I love th- that information because we can get so frustrated because we're adults and we're thinking we have a, an adult filter on everything. And we can get so frustrated with our kids for doing dumb things, mm-hmm. right? But they're doing dumb things because their brains aren't complete yet. They're, they're not developed. And, they yeah. are, and it's almost unfair to hold these kids to the standards of saying, you know, no re- if you even thought about it, you would have decided not to do that. You know? Uh-huh. But yet these children are just unable to think about it. Like the, the sensory part comes in, the signal gets sent, but the signal never reaches the decision-making part of the brain. Mm-hmm. And so they just, 
they they act more impulsively. That's why children don't understand consequences like mm-hmm. adults do, mm-hmm. because we have the physical capacity of understanding consequences better than children do. Mm-hmm. Physically, and then we just have you know wisdom from doing dumb things and going down different paths and whatnot. They just they don't have that life experience yeah. yet. Good decisions come from experience, and mm-hmm. experience comes from bad decisions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, what are Tell me about some of the cases that you see in your courtroom. So there's two sides to this court. One is the juvenile, one's the CPS. CPS cases are when there's a child in a situation with abuse or neglect that requires the removal of the child or maybe the termination of the parental rights. Where And that's we're talking termination where the parent never sees the child again. They have no rights to the children. They don't know where they live, who they live with, anything going on in their lives. They're just It's as if they were never born to these parents. So that's about half of, roughly half of what the court does. The other half is the juvenile justice area. That's when a child between 10 years old and 16 years old uh, breaks one of our criminal laws in the state, part of the penal code. At that point, uh, they're not adults, so they can't go to the adult court, so they get sent to one of the family courts. And that's what this is. It's the family court that deals specifically with juvenile matters. And so... Now, depending, uh, children, depending on the type of offense, they could be com- potentially committed to TJJD, which is basically prison for kids. Um, it's for any kind of felony, felony level offense or higher. Any misdemeanors in Texas, kids cannot be committed. Now, kids could be sent to placement, uh, to some kind of treatment, things like that, but they can't actually go to TJJD, where, where kids, which is the prison for children. Mm-hmm. Um, and the cases are anywhere from criminal trespass, where... Uh, there's kids that are told to, you, you got to leave school. You're fighting. You got to go home. Um, you know, you can't stay at school today. You can come back tomorrow. We're going to have a third party hearing or you're going to be transferred to the alternative school and the kid won't leave. Well, if the kid's not going to leave, that's criminal trespass. And then they get arrested all the way up to capital murder. I mean, there's capital murder cases that come through here as well uh, for these children that uh, capital murders when you're committing a felony that somebody dies. So maybe home invasion, burglary, or a robbery with a gun. Um, yeah, there's different factors that can be capital murder, but yeah, somebody has to die. And, and so we do have kids that do capital murder that come through there. So a fifth or sixth grade student in my son's school brought a gun to school last week. And he was just doing that so that he could show some friends. He was arrested children and youth are handled differently than adults as we know kind of tell me what the process is that takes place when something like that happens in the juvenile system so when a kid brings a gun to school then all these schools have a zero tolerance policy and they should i mean guns don't belong in schools Uh right unless it's by you know uh, an adult who's who's competent and and qualified to, to have the gun and so after arrest here in Tarrant County or across the state, they, uh, the police will bring the child to the juvenile detention center. Now, there is a juvenile detention center in every county across the state. Some counties share one, uh, but there's always a, a, a juvenile center for, e- for each county. And then the law says that uh, within two days, they have to see a judge. And the judge has to make the decision whether to release them uh, back to their parents or another competent adult or based on different factors, if they should be kept in the juvenile detention facility. These are factors like, are they going to come to court when they're supposed to, to take care of their case? Is there suitable supervision at home? Are they danger to themselves if you release them? Are they danger to the public if you release them? Um, there's just different factors that the court considers. And if you, and the presumption is to release them. We want to release the kids if we can. So, uh, you know, releasing to the parents or to, you know, sometimes it's grandma, grandpa, or, or relative, and then there's you know quite a few kids that are kept. You know, Tarrant County, uh, on average, has about 80 kids on any given day in the juvenile detention facility, uh, for one reason or another. And now, some of these are runaways from other states or counties. Mm-hmm. Some of these have parole violations or probation violations, and some of these just have pending cases because it's such a danger to the community or, or to themselves. You know, one could, you know, it's it's, I think it's well accepted that a kid that's using street drugs like methamphetamine, heroin, or cocaine. Is a danger to themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't. We have to protect kids from hurting themselves as well as other people. And so, a child that you know, like in your instance, would be brought to the facility, and then a judge would see them and make that decision to release them or to keep them. Uh, and there's, if they're released, uh, the case is pending, and they would have to show up for court to take care of the case. Very similar to the adult system. If they're in detentions, it's the same. There's just very accelerated deadlines 
uh, when a child is in the detention facility, we don't want children to be uh, forgotten in our facility here in Tarrant County. Mm -hmm. So there's very quick deadlines to make sure that the case moves and has resolution uh, fairly quickly. How long is fairly quickly, generally? Well, uh, that really depends. So there are times where, uh, and yeah, this has happened in the past, uh, where children have stayed in there for over a year because there were problems. Uh, there was um, there was a case that I inherited. The kid was already there, and there were problems with the DNA lab on a murder case. And because this, this was a murder and um, because of delays with, with some of the police departments, I just... You know, there was concerns about releasing him, but there's also problems with going forward with the trial because, you know, you have to, what if the d DNA exonerated the kid, right? Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure all the evidence is there. I, ideally, the goal is for me to have the kids in and out in 30 days at most. Okay. And with these kids, this case is done within a month. What are the penalties for doing what this child did at my kid's school? Oh, so the penalty, so carrying a weapon in school, it's a unlawfully carrying a weapon in a prohibited area. Um, and that that's actually a felony offense, and potentially it could be commitment uh, to TJJD. But remember, the presumption is always to rehabilitate the child. So the question is going to be, is this a one-off act where the kid just made a, uh, a poor decision or no decision and just acted impulsively? Or is this part of a pattern of behavior uh, of a kid that's truly dangerous to themselves or to others, at which point there's rehabilitation needed? So there's rehabilitation on the probation side and there's rehabilitation in the justice system. So what is the what is kind of the goal of the juvenile justice system? The goal of juven the juvenile justice system is rehabilitation. It's it's correcting this behavior of a child to, uh, I'm not going to say ensure, um, but to put the child in the best possible situation that they don't reoffend at, at any level, whether it's a child or as an adult or anywhere in the future is this idea that we want to help shape their thinking, help give them an experience where they remember, hey, there's good decisions and bad decisions. Let's make good decisions because the consequence uh, can be very negative. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the juvenile justice system is doing a good job of rehabilitating or do you think that there's kind of a revolving door? Well, that's hard. I, I think the intent is right. The And this is my criticism of our legislature is the Juvenile Justice Code is, a, is one of the worst written laws in Texas. And the reason why is because it was created because it needed to be created, but it was a very loose framework because they wanted judges to have as much discretion as possible. Well, then you had some justice, judges that abused the, the latitude that they were given, and so the legislature would start tightening down. Or you would have judges that followed or would have no idea what to do because, because the law was very poorly written. And so the Supreme Court of Texas would come in and say, no, you got this wrong even though you didn't know because the law didn't clarify it, this is the way you're supposed to handle this. And so the next session, the legislature will go fix that one issue instead of fixing the, the code as a whole. And so the juvenile justice code is a very, very much a, a, a patchwork of different laws and different legislative sessions and different attitudes. Um, you know, remember juvenile justice code was written before social media, before the internet, <laughs> um, you know, before all these modern things that we have and it's still kind of a very old focus and it's constantly evolving because everyone's committed to trying helping kids as much as they can um so as a whole it's it's kind of a wreck um but there's a lot of good judges that are doing this there's only 10 juvenile judges in the state most of these counties have courts of what's called general jurisdiction where the judges do not specialize and so they kind of handle everything mm -hmm. and juvenile uh, offenses are just part of that. In Tarrant, one of the urban, you know, all the urban counties, uh, we do have specialized judges in this matter. That allows me to focus more and really understand uh, adolescent behavior, adolescent thinking, uh, bigger signs of human trafficking with children, uh, signs of abuse, signs of recidivism behavior uh, signals, things like that. So I'm kind of specialized in that area. Um, so there's there's some inherent problems. Like here's a. So are you aware of what's called the Cobra effect? No. They never heard of the cobra. Cobra effect is when the British had colonized India, they wanted to get rid of cobras because they were around the villages. So they put a bounty on cobras and said, if you bring us a cobra head, we'll go ahead and give you this reward. So the villagers started um, harvesting cobras, providing the heads and getting the reward. And they realized, wait a minute, if I raise cobras, then I can just <laughs> cut off the head and sell them. So they started raising cobras. And then the British government realized what was happening, that there were now raised 
farm raised cobras that they're paying for. So they said, we're not going to stop. We're going to stop paying you for these cobras. So the, all the villagers that held, had all these cobras, they just released them. So now you had more cobras in the village than you started with. It's just an, it's a it's a kind of allegory on good intentions by the government don't always have good results. Right. right. Um, and so I think that's we have a lot of the cobra effect here in the juvenile justice system. Here's an example. Um, the castle doctrine. You're familiar with that? That's no. where you can have the castle doctrine. It's kind of passed several years ago in Texas. It allows homeowners to have guns in their house and the car is an extension of the home. Okay. And it makes it legal to have a firearm loaded or not in your car as long as you're otherwise le- allowed to have the gun. Uh-huh. Well, and that's fine. And I'm a big Second Amendment supporter and I'm fine. That's you're responsible. You need to be a responsible firearm owner. Well, the problem is two years later, the legislature said, we don't need to send kids to TJJD for misdemeanors, right? Marijuana, criminal trespass, um, maybe a, a fight, school fight. These are offenses that we do not need kids to go to TJJD. These are 100% rehabilitation available offenses, which sounds great. Well, the problem is you have to cut the li- you have to draw the line somewhere. They drew the line at misdemeanor versus felony. Well, burglary of a motor vehicle is a misdemeanor. So now you have kids that break into all these cars because they know they can't go to TJJD. And they know this. I mean, they'll tell me flat, they'll tell me to my face that they know that I can't send them to TJJD. So you'll have them break into cars, hundreds of cars over the summer. Yeah, burglary motor vehicle is a huge problem. If you look at the trends in Texas, even here in Tarrant County, Arlington, Mansfield, uh, BMVs, as we call them, have gone through the roof because there's it's a misdemeanor. So what happens then is now you have this mix of more guns and cars because we're legally authorized to, more burglaries because there's no consequence to it. So now you have more kids with guns. Well, these kids with guns now are on the streets selling them, trading them, um, and using them in crimes. So now I have this uptick in uh, aggravated robberies and aggravated assault deadly weapons and murders because you have more guns in kids' hands because there's a small penalty, a very inconvenience, it's not even a penalty, it's an inconvenience to get caught with burglarizing a motor vehicle. So that's the Cobra effect that we have. Oh my gosh. So what things are in place in once you are incarcerated, what things are in place to rehabilitate? What are they doing? Okay, so it depends. So there are treatment facilities that we can send kids to different, there's facilities all across the country. They can be things for like uh, victims of human trafficking, for substance abuse, for um, for psychological problems, um, and mental health is a big issue among children right now. It's a huge issue. Yeah. Um, and, and there's uh, for violent crimes. So there's all these different facilities that we can what we call place them, and that's where our tax dollars are spent to send these kids over. Um, there's big ones in Pennsylvania, Iowa, California, New Mexico, Arizona. Um, and they send, spend anywhere from six to nine months there. It's a, it's a treatment facility to help correct their behavioral problems. That's kind of on the, that's the last step that we take before we actually commit them to TJJD. Locally, we have probation. We have uh, probation departments. We have different classes, different community organizations that can help with this, um, with these same issues, with substance abuse, with uh, being victim of trafficking, with psychological problems, with sex offender treatment for, for the sex offender cases that we have. Um, for behavioral management. Uh, these are all things that can be handled on the local level as well, where they stay at home. And generally, a lot of these things, we it's kind of stair-stepped. You know, you first start off as a minor problem. You may help them with some of these classes where they live at home. Their parents take them to these classes. They finish it. Uh, they finish their probation. Their record gets automatically sealed. Best case scenario. Mm-hmm. Then you have the kids that repeatedly violate their probation, have problems, and then those end up, uh, you know, end up with out-of-state placements or sometimes... Or, and there's some, there's some, they're not just all out of state. There's some placements here in state, just outside of Tarrant County. Um, and then, uh, worst case scenario is when all hope is given up. That sometimes you have to re- just commit them to TJJD, because our TJJD actually has every single program available for children there in one facility. And so a lot of times, if there's multiple issues that need treatment, and these kids just aren't rehabilitating on these individual placements. Sometimes you have to send them to TJJD because they have all the options there. And how successful are we? Well, um, you know, the straight truth, Tarrant County is actually very unsuccessful. Of the urban counties, Tarrant County, uh, well, and this is based on a study done in 2000, I think 16, based on 2014 data. And so 
there that was the last major study done across the state of Texas. So this is you know um, this is old numbers, you know I guess five years now. Uh, but Tarrant County had the highest recidivism rate of any urban county in the state. Wow. Um, you know the there's so many other factors to recidivism. I think the biggest problem with determining juvenile recidivism is that the children, their brains are actively changing. Yeah. Right. What we have to remember in the juvenile system that we don't see in the adult system, and I'm going to say this because we read in the paper, see in the news, or read online of these kids that commit these horrible crimes. What we have to remember is because of the phys- physiological development of these children, a child six months from the time of the offense is, could be a totally different child. Right. They may have matured so much that they <clears throat> they would never risk of reoffending. Like they wouldn't do that offense had they only been six months older, because they're actively changing. Unlike adults, where you have a fifty year old man that commits a crime, well, you know what, he was gonna do that at forty nine or fifty one. Mm-hmm. I mean that was the decision that he made and he made that conscious decision. A lot of these kids aren't making conscious decisions. <clears throat> and so when you have a probation Sometimes just six weeks of probation has the same net effect as what two or three years would be on an adult. Interesting. Because you can hit them. At, remember what I was saying at the beginning, why like coaching junior high <clears throat> right. is your kid that catching that age where you can shape them. Still ma- malleable at that age. Absolutely. And so the rehabilitation at the juvenile level, a lot of times when you're catching them at the right age, you can make a world of difference just with small corrective measures. Mm-hmm. So other than the crime committed... What are the factors that you take into place when you're sentencing? It's so the things that I consider are things like the nature and the seriousness of the offense, mm-hmm. um, the amount of planning or foresight it went into planning the the offense uh-huh. or trying to cover it up is another big issue for me. Um, I'm also thinking about the victim. You know, was it was it a crime against uh, nobody? Was it a victimless crime? Was it a crime against property? Was it a crime against a person? You know, did, did somebody burn down a church or did somebody shoot somebody? <clears throat> um, uh, thinking about the where they are in life, like what have they done already towards steps of rehabilitation? I also look at the stability of the home. If it's a very unstable home, if if the parents are encouraging this type of criminal behavior. I mean, I have parents that, I have kids that come through here where the parents encourage them to get in a knife fight. I mean, as crazy as it sounds, but it's really hard to return a kid to an environment where the parents are only encouraging the behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, the, the the things that absolutely that I don't consider is I don't consider um, finances and any of the decisions I make. It is not illegal to be poor in Texas, <laughs> right? And while many of the laws that we have or culture may um, seem like it penalizes poor people, uh-huh. but in the 323rd, I. I make it very explicitly clear that it is not illegal to be poor. Like if, if CPS comes and says, you know, we want to take these kids because the parents are living in a tent, my response, and by the way, they've stopped asking because my response every time is, well, you know, Abraham and Sarah lived in a tent. Mm. You know, and that's just, that's, that's the long and short of it. It's not illegal to be poor. You don't have to have electricity. I just need to make sure that the kids are, they have access to the medical care if they need it. I need to make sure that they have access to the proper you know, nutrition um, and that they have to be, um, their hygiene has to be decent, right? Just something acceptable and, and they have to be, you know, uh, going to school or getting re- some kind of education. And those are the minimum requirements. So the parents are providing shelter, food, uh, clothes, appropriate clothes for the weather and, and education. Uh, that's, that's at the bare minimum what the parents need to do. And I'm not going to hold a parent for not providing more. Is there a high probability that they're able to provide those things if they're living outside or in a tent? Medical attention and... Well, so the thing is, so we can't... Our government's job is not to enforce thought crimes or not to enforce laws on what could happen, Mm -hmm. right? Our government's job is to do things reactively. And that's just part of liberty. We all have the ability to make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. and, And the law allows that. Our founding fathers wanted that. What it is is our bad decisions can't actually negatively affect somebody else, okay? So just because it could affect a kid doesn't give the government the right to take a kid away, Mm -hmm. right? It's the the harm actually has to happen, which may be frustrating because you hear in the news, well, you know, CPS tried to get the judge to try to remove the kids, but the judge said no. Well, it very well could be one of those. There was no actual... as a judge, it'd be, I wouldn't be, I, I need to stay in my lane. I can't say, well, this parent might do a bad thing, so uh, I, I want to get involved in this one. That's, 
I think there's a, a presumption that parents are going to make the best decision. And until the parents make a bad decision, the law needs to stay out of that. Uh, it's about 11.30, so we want to just take a quick break to say that if you have any questions or comments for our guest, Judge Alex Kim, give us a call at 214-431-5062. So I'd love to talk about, you know, just as parents, we are working really hard to make sure that our kids are um, raised right and that they are um, contributing to society in a positive way. What do you think are some of the reasons that kids end up in your cl- your courtroom? Well, so you're asking me about causation, and that's that's tough because there's so many people reasons. that can. I mean, there's worlds of academia that will focus on that and try and guess at that. Now, I can talk about correlation because that gives me. A, I have. I actually have my personal experience. I can talk about correlation, but the caveat is correlation is not causation, uh-huh. right? Um, uh, there's always clouds in the sky when it rains, but clouds don't cause rain, right? Um, so if there's two factors that I've noticed I was very surprised by in the nine months I've been there, the number one correlation between kids in the juvenile justice system and, and their so, their home factor is single parent, single parenthood. Mm. Uh, I would say close to 80% of the kids that go through the juvenile justice system are from a single parent family. 80, wow. Yeah, it's just, it's through the roof. That is, I mean, that's a 0.8 correlation factor. I don't know anything else. I mean, there are very few things in life that you can point to a 0.8 correlation factor. Um, it's just shocking, you know, how much it is. It's the, and I don't, I don't know if it's, so now we can talk about the causation, right? So we know the correlation's there. We know it's about a point, at about 80% correlation. Now, my question is going to be, is it because you don't have two parents that are both working together for this kid? Is it because you may have one parent that has to work long hours or odd hours or two jobs so they're not around to provide guidance for the kid? Um, Is it because you have a child that can more easily manipulate just one parent rather than two? Is it because you don't have the life experiences from two different individuals that help shape a kid uh, with additional decision-making ability to equip them? Is it that two parents aren't able to be active in the kid's life as far as academically, uh, with their extracurriculars, uh, without this? I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why one parent versus two parent could affect the kid. I don't know what it is, um, but I just do know that correlation is there. Um, the other correlation, huge correlation that I've seen is mental health. Yeah. Uh, I would say roughly half the kids coming through the juvenile justice system uh, have some kind of diagnosed mental health issue. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's, we've overdiagnosed it. And again, let's go to the correlation part. It could be, you know, my sister's a psychiatrist and one of her complaints is that we're overdiagnosing things. Every time a new DSM comes out, it expands the list of every diagnosis. So it makes it easier to diagnose children with a new disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, so are we now, have we expanded the definition of ADHD so much that we can almost put every kid as ADHD if we wanted to. Right. So have we just, so now are we talking about, was there a problem before that now we have, um, what's the best way to say this? Were, were there behavioral problems in the child before that now qualify? So now we diagnose them when the actual issue isn't a mental health disorder that we need to medicate. Rather, it's a, uh, a behavioral problem that could have been corrected some other means other than medication. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I learned so much about the correlation between school and the juvenile justice system just in researching for this show. And I learned that in the 90s, as a response to school shootings that we're, we were experiencing, we've had more of a police presence in schools. So what would you say the impact of having police on campus has been? Has it been a negative impact, a positive impact? Is it making changes and making our schools more safe? That's hard to say because things, things, nothing's in a vacuum, right? So we have to remember is we put school resource officers there, but then we also have the juvenile court to work with the school officers. If there's not a good relationship with the school officers and the juvenile court, then that di- di- disincentivizes the school officers from being very proactive. Um, I can't talk about what they've done before, the, the judges prior to me. Um, you're also talking about what kind of community. You know, there's, there's no... Um, there, there's no argument that uh, African American communities, police presence in Afri- African American communities is received differently than in Caucasian communities, right? In the suburbs, it's just 
uh, and there's all kinds of study. There's a big FBI study that was, I think, a 10-year study that just got published last year that talked about use of force with with uh, Af- with minorities, not just African Americans, but with between minorities and Caucasians. And that was a groundbreaking study that I think they followed 10 police departments for 10 years, um, and it was huge. And that gave a lot of information for everyone to use. I think it's 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 a very unique experience. I, I know for me. From what I've seen, it's important to have school officer, school resource officers there because you have to remember in this day and age, because of I don't know what's different. You know, it seems like the the crimes that we have, we have a lot more drug possessions in schools, we have a lot more thefts in schools. I mean, I think there's more to steal now. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, in the '80s, n- the most expensive thing I had at school was a graphic calculator, right? <laughs> which cost like eighty dollars, which was I, right. mean, I guess was a lot of money in the '80s. But the thing is, is Nobody really wants to steal graphic calculators. No. Right? That's not a high-value item. Um, if you've already got a graphic calculator, you don't need a second one. And if you're 16 years old, you're not going to a pawn shop to sell graphic calculators. <laughs> right? But yet here now, you know, all the phones, all the tablets, all the expensive things that we g- give our kids. The shoes. The shoes. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when the first Air Jordans came out. Uh-huh. And I told my mom I want a $100 pair of sneakers. <laughs> did she laugh? She laughed. I was like, no. <laughs> That's what we did when our no, kids said that. <laughs> no, I got my Adidas. That's what I got. They're $20, $28. And those are expensive. Because they were like the most expensive shoe before the Jordans was like 35 bucks. Right. And then all of a sudden it's 100 Yeah, so... Um, so I think we have a lot more that can be stolen now, and so you have a lot more crimes at schools. I, th- I think having school resource officers there is, is a benefit because think about if we didn't. If we didn't, then what happens now is you have a principal that is more or less affecting an arrest, right? You have school staff or faculty that is now uh, taking the role of law enforcement. Now, God bless the principals that are out here uh, in our community, but they're not law enforcement officers. They don't understand Fourth Amendment or Sixth Amendment or search and seizure principles. Uh, but they become government agents or uh, when they actually start the arrest. And so I think it's important to have a police there because we do have a lot more crimes in schools. What's interesting that I've noticed, I've been through my first summer as a judge, is crime by juveniles goes to the roof during the summer. Okay? Yeah. They have more time. Uh-huh. Right? The referrals to the juvenile court bottoms out during the summer. Uh-huh. Because so many of our of the arrests of kids in Tarrant County happen on the way to school, at school, or on the way home from school. Mm. And now that they're on, own, they're on their own during the summer, a lot of times with little supervision, you have more burglary motor vehicles. You have more criminal trespass. You have, you know, you have a lot of kids that are doing things because they have more free time. They're just not caught. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think school resource officers play a very important role because if we're going to start in, in setting these policies in our schools of we're not going to tolerate, and don't get me wrong, we should have these policies. We're not going to tolerate drugs. We're not going to tolerate theft. We're not going to tolerate fights, things like that. You know, when I got in a fight in junior high, you know, I got called in the principal's office. The kid I fought got called into the other principal's office we were both speaking to, and, and we both got one day of in-school suspension, right? And mm-hmm. it was just taken care of like that. Now, uh, I don't know if the school's handled that way or if they get referred to our court, um, but it's important to have, if you're going to start penalizing on the criminal level, some of these acts of the kids in the schools, I think it's important to have somebody who understands the criminal laws uh, that are helping force in those laws. Right. So talk to us about the school to prison pipeline. What is that and how has this all come about? Right. So, I mean, a lot of this is going to be you have a kid that has a problem, right? And then they end up in the juvenile justice system. For some reason, the juvenile justice system either doesn't do their job in providing rehabilitation or maybe the, maybe the parents are antagonistic to the juvenile justice system. Maybe they feel like this is not a government issue, this is a parent issue, or you need to stay out of our lives, don't tell me how to raise my kid. But either way, what happens is you have a child that grows up and starts to develop more of what's called criminal thinking. Right? They start to think about, hey, you know, it's not about whether this is right or wrong, this is about how do I escape the law, how do I not get caught? Okay, mm-hmm. and to a degree, we have a lot of our society teaching kids criminal thinking. Not just kids, but adults as well. Right. Uh, criminal thinking is a huge problem, and that is probably, an, as a defense attorney, I'll tell you that was one of the biggest problems I had with my clients is that they wouldn't stop engaging in criminal thinking. So we took we talked about marijuana, right? You can't talk about crime anymore without talking about marijuana because it's what a lot of people call victimless crime. And you know, to a degree, I, I don't disagree with that. I think there's problems with cartels and, and the drug trade, trafficking trade. But overall, just marijuana itself, it's it's illegal. But, you know, I understand the arguments both ways. 
Here's the thing about marijuana. The problem isn't the marijuana itself. And when say they say it's a gateway drug, it's not that somebody will be smoking some kind of ditch weed or some kind of marijuana or go to Colorado on vacation and smoke it legally there and then come back and be like, hey, I'm a, I'm a heroin addict. Right? It doesn't jump like that. Right. The problem with marijuana is that you have people, whether they're juveniles or adults, that maybe start smoking weed and then they hang out with friends who smoke weed and it becomes part of their lifestyle. And then over time, as time goes by, they're like, hey, you know, I've been smoking weed for six months. Hey, we got pulled over by the police and they never found the weed. Hey, you know, it was in my backpack at school and I never got caught. And it desensitizes you and starts making individuals think, hey, I can break the law and I get caught because I'm too smart for the law. What people don't understand is you always get caught. I mean, people just eventually, you just, you, it's, it's eventually the path leads to getting caught if you continue to break the law. That's just the way the laws work. And so people go from maybe marijuana to maybe uh, uh, Alprazolam, Xanax bars, or they may pick some other kind of pills or hydrocodone or, or things like that. Or, and they'll just slowly take these steps thinking, hey, I'm not getting caught. I can get away with this. I'm more willing to try other drugs because I know that I'm not going to go to prison. And all of a sudden they're caught with, you know, a gram of meth, right? Because eventually you get caught. And I think that's kind of what the illustration of criminal thinking, I think a lot of kids now uh, are engaging more and more in criminal thinking. If you, you know, every time you hear about uh, some kind of big crime in the news, you, they always talk about their Google searches and talk about, you know, how do you kill your spouse or right. how do you hide a body? You know, people start thinking and researching on criminal thinking, how to, how to avoid getting caught. And then what happens is eventually you get caught. You know, when we don't have consequences, we don't have uh, a legal system that addresses these issues with juveniles saying, look, it's not, the problem isn't you got caught. The problem is that you're willing to break the law. Mm -hmm. Either you live right or you live wrong. And that's the decision that you have to make. Just live right. I think it takes a very proactive judge to do that. Somebody who really cares about the kids. Somebody who's willing to take the extra time to have the individual conversation with them to say, look, the, the problem isn't that you were acting up in class, right? The problem is you're acting up in class then start throwing things around. And then when they principal tried to calm you down you hit the principal like the school would have been fine with you acting up the problem is once you hit the principal then now it becomes now you're talking to me we never would have had this conversation this is me talking to the kid had you realized that there's there's limits there's boundaries you have to realize what's acceptable and what's not acceptable but what you have to realize also is there's consequences if you understood that acting up in class had a consequence of maybe in school suspension it would have been done and you'd learn from it and you would have moved on. It wouldn't be an issue anymore. The fact that you kept on escalating it, you have to realize it doesn't go away because you escalate it. Right. Is there, so there's a lot of criticism with the school systems and the zero tolerance policies. And there's criticism that the schools are kind of outsourcing discipline to the juvenile justice system. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? And what if what about these children who are don't have criminal thinking and really they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing as kids because their brains aren't fully developed and just making dumb decisions mm -hmm. and they're ending up in front of you and they're not really they shouldn't be there. Right. So there I don't want to give the misconception. So at the 323rd and the juvenile justice department in Tarrant County as a whole are like we really try and identify these kids that don't need additional help like this is just a one poor decision mm -hmm. you know the kid that maybe got caught marijuana in a locker and is willing to take drug tests and he has dropped it and because he doesn't want to kicked off the football team which is a poor decision or you may have the kid that um you know broke into school overnight because and just walked the hallways because it was like seemed like the thing to do right, right. didn't steal anything didn't damage anything there's an open window they just crawled in saying hey i wonder what school's like uh, overnight i mean things like this happen and these kids are not bad kids that need rehabilitation a lot of times it's just a lack of thought lack of foresight you know nobody got hurt um, these are things where we have a great system here in tarrant county to make sure that these kids do not have any kind of criminal record any kind of juvenile record this won't come back in fact, I have uh, regularly, I see kids who, or adults now trying to get in the military and, you know, they had some kind of juvenile experience and they need the record unsealed for Uncle Sam to, to enlist. And I'll go through and I'll look at it and I'll, I'll tell the federal government, I was like, you know, there's none of your business. I'm going to tell you what you need to know, which is there's never a case filed. Um, he never had probation and the case will never be filed because the statute of limitations has, rolled, uh, has, has expired, you know. 
I, I want to help these kids. I want these kids to go ahead and, and, and take this chance on the small corrective measure and then blossom and do wonderful things in life. And it's even more exciting for these kids that come from humble beginnings because the ones that come from humble beginnings that really truly have the deck stacked against them and they can go and succeed and do wonderful things with their lives, overcoming the odds that they came from. I, I'm trying to tell these kids, especially the ones that are, are from very humble beginnings, is that should be your point of pride. That should be you saying to the world when you make it to say, look, I didn't have the opportunity but I didn't let that slow me down. That was never a crutch. That was never an excuse. That was my motivation, is to show the world that this, the American dream is alive, especially in Tarrant County, Texas, that, that it's just hard work, it's discipline, it's self-control, and you can succeed in life. That's the message I'm trying to project to these kids. Yeah. It sounds like we're doing a great job in Tarrant County. Do you think that as a whole, the juvenile system is doing a good job of making sure that the kids that should not be there are not ending up in the system? That's tough. So what you have in our legislature is you have two conflicting forces. Okay, You have the, the, the one side that's very much, hey, there's consequences for poor decisions. right? Mm-hmm. And I get that. And I'm, I'm, I'm behind that. Um, I think we all need that. Uh, there are, whether it's a child or an adult, if you kill another person, there's, in Texas, we don't tolerate people taking other people's lives. right? Other states may, but we don't here. The conflicting force, though, is you have the people that are saying, look, we don't need to create a culture of incarceration um it, it's, it's funny so i don't know, I'd say funny it's not haha funny but it's just ironically interesting so you have a disparity in, in incarceration rates by ethnicity and adults right mm-hmm. african-americans are six times more likely to be incarcerated than a caucasian yeah hispanics are 2.8 times more likely to be incarcerated than a caucasian mm-hmm. it's there mm-hmm. in the juvenile system you would think because the focus because there's so few judges we're all focused on this we're more aware we're more educated on this subject we're told by the legislature to make a bigger effort to uh to to compensate for this ethnic disparity Mm -hmm. juveniles being committed to tjjd is six times more likely if you're african-american than caucasian hispanic Uh 2.8 times more likely It's, it's the exact same rates and so even though that as a judge i am making a conscious effort to offset that that disparity in incarceration rates yet it's, it's the same and so i don't know if it's a wh- where the problem lies you know is it one of those is it a cultural thing or you know do we have uh are africans more african americans more likely to be caught with controlled substances more likely to be searched do we have a higher police presence in african-american neighborhoods where people are more likely to be caught the Caucasian neighborhoods and there's all kinds of factors in there and there's a fatherlessness that you talked about there is a fatherless high, high right. level of that and it doesn't matter if you didn't have a father or a single if you're a single parent host, household when you're 40 and when you're 14 either way you grew up in a single parent household and so that may affect things as well it may change the way that people actually think or or the way they interact with others in our society um, so when you're asking how good is the juvenile system work you have this conflict of you have one side on the legislature that wants to raise the age of, of juvenile um, culpability. So right now, at 10 years old, you can go to the juvenile detention facility. Mm-hmm. It's on Kimbo Road, so it's called Kimbo. Uh, they're trying to raise that to 12, which I, I get it. I understand. Um, and they're trying to raise it on the other end, too. Right now, a 17-year-old is considered an adult. They're trying to raise the age of criminal culpability in Texas to 18. And so it would go from 10 to 16 to 12 to, to 17, which I get. And they're, and they're trying to, uh, they've shut down several juvenile commitment facilities, several, several youth prisons. There's a focus, there's quotas set on each county saying, hey, look, these are the most kids that you can send per year or else the state will fine or penalize the county for sending too many. Um, you know, you have all this from the legislature saying, we're going to shrink the system. Everything should be community-based. You don't need commitments. You need more treatment. Um, and then you have the other side saying, hey, look, but sometimes you need consequences. So you have this fight in Austin every other year wow. when the legislature meets. So, man, this is such a complicated issue. Yeah. <laughs> and we do not have time to get into a whole lot of it. Gosh. Okay. So knowing what you've seen, you have a son, right? I do have a seven-year-old boy. A seven-year-old. Knowing what you've seen and what you've experienced in your courtroom, what are you trying to instill in him? What's what's what are you adamant about? You know, the big thing is so it's crazy and it drives my wife crazy. But the the big things is I want to teach about consequences. 
When you make a bad decision, there's mm-hmm. a consequence to that. When you make a good decision, there's a consequence to that. The second thing that I think is so important to teach my kid is about disappointment. Mm-hmm. I think we have a culture where we're yes. afraid to disappoint our children that they don't get what they want, then they throw a tantrum or they're upset, like they're entitled to deserve anything. What my son, I hope he realizes is sometimes in life you're going to be disappointed and that's okay. Maybe that's a motivation. Maybe that's a learning experience. Maybe that's uh, something that you springboard off of to do something greater. You know, the first time I ran for judge was in 14. I made the r- runoff and I lost in the runoff in the primary. You know, was disappointed, but I didn't think anything less of myself. I didn't quit. That was just a point to say, hey, I learned from this and let's move forward. I am trying so hard to teach my, my son about disappointment and being okay with disappointment. You don't always get what you want, but that's that's all right. Mm-hmm. Because we are a very t- entitled generation, um, and we just think we we are just we there are certain things that we should have, and we don't necessarily have to work so hard for them. And mm-hmm. yeah, I have kids. My policy is, you know, when you're brought back into Kimbo, right, our detention facility, and and we'll drug test you, and if you're positive, then you don't get to go out. Like you don't get to be on probation and smoke marijuana. Mm-hmm. That's a consequence. And don't I don't want to argue about the the benefits if it's legal in a different state or anything like that. It is it's you are not using weed while uh, you're on my probation. And these kids are just shocked because the previous judges didn't do this, and they're just surprised. They're like, it's just weed. I'm like, well, you know what the rule is. You're not supposed to use it. It's you know, and and but you starting to I'm starting to see this in the nine months. These kids are getting it. They're understanding that this judge really expects you to hold up your end of the deal. And I'll hold up my end of the deal. Sometimes I make a bad deal for myself. Like I'll make a deal with a kid or a promise to a kid that in retrospect, like I shouldn't have done it because mm-hmm. I gave up too much. But you know what? I always hold up my end of the deal because the last thing I want to do is give that child this idea that an adult, a person of authority can make a promise to them that's not going to hold up their end of the deal. Because mm-hmm. if I don't, then why should they? Yeah. And so I'm I'm tough, but I'm fair. I'm 100% consistent. And I'll tell them, it's like, you know what? I messed up here, but I'm going to honor my deal. Yeah. If you could go back in time and talk to some of the parents before they end, before their children ended up in your courtroom, what would you say to them? What advice would you give? You know, I, I, and this isn't so much from a judge, but this is more from being a coach, is you're not supposed to be your kid's friend. You're supposed to be their parent, mm-hmm. right? That means you're supposed to disappoint them. You're not supposed to, you know, there's a, um, a friend of mine, uh, an educator, and her philosophy is her child can make any decision that the child, and that's it. Well, th- put it in context, the child is now, I think, four years old. The child can make any decisions she wants as long as it does not affect anybody else. So the child, when they're at the restaurant, can pick what she's going to eat, but she's not going to pick what restaurant they go to. That's not that child's job yet. I think as a society, we kind of overstimulate our kids. We give them too much. We feed them information through YouTube and and electronic devices that they constantly need to be fed information. They're no longer seeking out. They're no longer active. Uh, you know, when we hear about this, you know, when we're growing up, we play outside. You know, and I think we kind of spoon, we, we force information on our kids through, through uh, electronics. Um, I think we don't teach them disappointment. I don't think we, we teach them how to, cope with or process this idea if they don't get what they want because then they can't handle that later on in life when their boss tells them no you can't do this or you need to clean bathrooms or um, Hmm. I don't think we put enough uh, accountability on children when they screw up we're too quick to say you know what just next time do it right instead of saying hey look you messed up now this is the consequence let's move forward all right just you know you got to accept uh, the result of what you did um and I think try too hard to be their buddies. I think parents try too hard to be their friends and say, you know, I want you to be able to talk to me about everything, so I'm going to be your peer. I don't think parents, uh, kids need peers. They have their own they peers. They have them. They need somebody who has wisdom, who has knowledge, who has experience, who can guide them to say, hey, look, you know, you may tell me something that disappoints me or upset or makes me angry, right? Um, there may be consequences. Consequence to this. This isn't because I don't love you that this consequence is here. The consequence is here because I, I do love you. It's because I need you to understand that in life, when you do something wrong, that bad things happen. You know, there's negative consequences of things. Um, and, you know, I see these parents that feel like, you know, they're my buddy and they can help me anything. Well, you know what? I don't know it's healthy for a child to be able to tell a parent anything. 
I mean, if a child is engaging in illegal or illicit behavior, do we really want that child to feel so proud of it that they can tell their parent? Mm -hmm. Or should there be a certain amount of shame or embarrassment in something like this? Should a child be able to say to his parent, yeah, we went and stole beer from a 7-Eleven? And the parents, should they be proud? Be like, yeah, my child, we're so close that they can tell me that they committed aggravated robbery, right? Or should we be like, no, they, sh they should, their fear should be, I'm not going to steal beer from the 7-Eleven at 15 years old because I don't want my parents to find out because I'm going to get punished for this. It's not okay. So that's, that's you know, if I could kind of convey that in other parent, like my own personal parenting, and I'm no parental expert. You know, <laughs> I, I'm an attorney, uh, now a judge. So I'm not an expert in child development, um, but from my perspective on seeing clients that have gotten in trouble with the law, I think that's probably my biggest fear is my kid ending up, you know, getting the call at night and being like, Dad, I need to be bailed out of jail. Mm -hmm. may happen. You know, I can't control that. Um, but hopefully that's, that's my idea. If we have this, these laws, this structure in society, I want my kid to grow up following the rules that we have. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. We are out of time. This is a subject we're going to have to revisit because there are so many things that we could have talked about that we didn't get to. But thanks for joining oh, us. Oh, it's been my pleasure and my privilege to be here. Thank oh, you. Well, thank you. So we always want to let you guys know what's happening with Noggin and specifically with School Days. We're so proud to announce that we've been nominated for two Sharky Awards. We were nominated for Blue Bowl Best Show of the Year and Best Female Host. So thank you so much for that honor, and we would love to win, but we can't do that without you. So head to schooldaysshow.com and cast your vote. And also, I will put a link in the Facebook, Facebook Live feed here uh, for your convenience if you're watching us online. So it's finally here. North Texas Giving Day is an 18-hour online giving event designed to empower every person to give back to their community by supporting not North Texas nonprofits and causes that they care about. So each year, Noggin receives support from cities all over the United States. And because of our school day show, listeners from around the world, we're hoping to get support from around the globe. Noggin Foundation uses the money collected from North Texas Giving Day to fund our free tutoring program. This year, we were able to give free tutoring to 13 students because of last year's North Texas Giving Day. This year, we already have 20 plus kids on the waiting list. So we are asking that 334 people give $30. And if your pocketbooks tells you that you can give more than $30, that will help us get to our goal even faster. You can schedule your giving today through September 18th. And North Texas Giving Day is actually on September 19th. And that's my birthday, y'all. So to give, you search for Noggin, that's N-O-G-G-I-N, on NorthTexasGivingDay.com, or you can go to SchoolDayShow.com, and I'm also going to put a link in the Facebook Live that we're doing here as well for your convenience. We do want to give a special thanks to our gold and platinum level corporate champions. These are businesses that are in the DFW Metroplex. We want to thank Tarrant Roofing, and we want to thank friend of the show, Michael Flores, for with a Brighter Possibilities Family Counseling. Next week, I'll sit down with Stacy Danford, who is an educational neuroscientist and a gratitude expert with a master's degree in mind, brain, and education. She has taught thousands of students how to achieve greater success by maximizing their strengths and uncovering their hidden potential. I saw her a few weeks ago on Good Morning Texas talking about rewiring your brain, and I sent her an email immediately, and she agreed to come and talk to us. So make sure you share with your parent friends about next week. As always, head to our website, schooldazedshow.com, for more information. And remember, you don't ever have to miss a show. Find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, and pretty much anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast. And don't forget to find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Noggin Foundation. That's N-O-G-G-I-N. And do you YouTube? You can find episodes of School Days and other videos featuring the fun educational programs we offer through Noggin Educational Foundation. So go to YouTube and search for Noggin Educational Foundation. And last but not least, we, wanna, we always want to end our show by saying that David and I are parenting by grace. We depend on God to give us the wisdom and the strength that we need to raise our kids into flourishing adults. And if you'd like to know more about that, I'd be happy to share with you. Email me at info at schooldazedshow.com. You guys have a great week.
School Days is sponsored by Noggin Educational Foundation. At Noggin, we provide free educational resources to students from low-income families and support to their parents like the preceding broadcast. School Days is made possible by the generosity of listeners just like you. Please consider donating to Noggin at Noggin, N-O-G-G-I-N, foundation.org. Are you looking for the hottest music, topics, and trends? Then you've come to the right spot. Fishbowl Radio Network or FBRN.us. Right now, you're tuned into the largest personality-driven internet radio station. Check out the green, red, blue, or...